Welcome everybody to chapter 10, where we talk about the short run fluctuations of the business cycle. This is the structure of uh, this chapter. So we'll talk about uh, the stylized facts in the beginning. We'll introduce one model where aggregate demand and aggregate supply play a role. And then we will uh, work with this new model. Short-term fluctuations in output and employment are called the business cycle. These fluctuations are not regular and not predictable, but irregular and more or less unpredictable. The following questions will be answered in this chapter, like what causes short-term fluctuations in the business cycle? What kind of model should we use to explain these short-run fluctuations? And can policymakers avoid a recession? And if so, what kind of instruments and policies do the policymakers uh, implement in order to avoid a recession? So in this chapter, we examine the data which describe short-term fluctuations. We'll also discuss key differences how economies behave in the short run and in the long run. And we will also introduce like a model of aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And this model is used by a lot of economists to explain short run fluctuations. In this uh, graph, we can see a line diagram. So the real GDP growth rate in the US over time. The average is at the level of 3%, but we can see these short run fluctuations. For example, here we can see the recession in the 1980s caused by the uh, second oil price shock or 2008-2009, the shock which is related uh, to the uh, financial crisis. So these shaded areas here, they indicate times of recessions. What is a recession? The textbook presents the following rule of thumb. A recession is a period of at least two consecutive quarters where the GDP declines. Decline of GDP implies that the growth rate of real GDP is negative. In the US, it is the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, which chooses the starting date of each recession and also the ending date of each recession. Until now, we only had a look at the real GDP growth rate in the US. What about the different components of GDP, such as consumption and investment? Do they also fluctuate over the business cycle? And which one is more volatile? In the next graph, you can see that investment is far more volatile than consumption over the business cycle. So once more, the uh, shaded areas indicate times of recession. And in a recession, it is the case that the growth rate of consumption is uh, lower or even negative, uh, which is the, the, also the case for the growth rate of investment. But when you look at the vertical axis, then it is the case that the amplitude of volatility is far larger when it comes to the growth rate of investment. Investment can collapse by about 20%, which is not the case when we talk about consumption. So until now, we only used line diagrams to highlight how the one or the other measures behave over time. We can also come up with a scatter diagram and look at the relationship between, for example, the percentage change in real GDP, like the growth rate in real GDP, and the change in the unemployment rate. Uh, we have talked about this relationship already. You are familiar with this kind of scatter diagram. Um, 
this relationship between the growth rate of real GDP and the unemployment rate is called Okun's law. And what is very special is that there is a negative relationship. This implies that when the growth rate of real GDP is pretty high, then the unemployment rate will decrease because the change in the unemployment rate is negative. In case that the growth rate of real GDP is pretty low, then the change in the unemployment rate is positive, the unemployment rate will increase. One important detail here, MANQ puts the percentage change in real GDP on the vertical axis. We, in our lecture, uh, until now had the change in the unemployment rate on the vertical axis. So this is special and therefore I'm pointing it out. What is the functional relationship? The change in the real GDP is equal to 3% minus 2 times the change in the unemployment rate. Therefore, in case that the change in the unemployment rate should be constant, we need a real growth rate of real GDP equal to 3%. So the U US economy needs to grow by 3% each year so that the growth, so that the unemployment rate is constant. The next subchapter talks about leading indicators and a very long list of leading indicators is presented in the textbook. But in the end, it is mentioned that leading indicators are far from precise in order to forecast the business cycle in the future. And short run economic fluctuations are largely unpredictable. Nonetheless, the uh, textbook ar argues it is an, a use. Nevertheless, the textbook still argues that leading indicators can be a useful in uh, input factor for the pr prediction process. One example. Um, for a leading indicator is, for example, the weekly uh, initial claims for unemployment insurance, like how many uh, people become unemployed within one week and they are filing for unemployment support. The following graph stems from the Financial Times and it shows the initial claims of unemployment in the US. In the financial crisis of 2008-2009, the highest number of weekly unemployed people was equal to 665,000. But in the most recent corona crisis, it was a case that in one week, 6.6 .6 million Americans became unemployed. This is very, very huge number, which we have not seen so far. Let's have a look how it looks like right now. So this is like the same graph. It stems from the FRED database, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And here we can see how this number behaved over time. And the highest number is this 6.6 .6 million. So the most recent figure is still 750,000, much higher than the number in the great financial crisis. So still, this corona crisis affects the American labor market to a very large extent. In this chapter 10, a new model is introduced, like this aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. Why is it the case that we need one more model? Why do economists need different models for different time horizons? In the long run, it is the case that the prices and the nominal wages are flexible and can respond to changes in goods demand or goods supply. But in the short run, prices are sticky at a predetermined level and therefore prices cannot adjust in the short run. Like the quantity theory of money predicts that in the long run, 
when money supply decreases, also the prices decrease. But a reduction in money supply does not lead all companies to change the price tags and print new menu cards, so new price lists, or reduce nominal wages immediately. This needs time. And in one study of Blinder, he asked managers how often do you change prices. And 10% of the managers responded less than once a year. So 10% of the managers do not change the prices within one year. But 40% of the managers said we are changing the prices once a year. 1.6% of all companies change the prices more than 365 year, uh, times a year. What kind of industry changes the prices on a daily basis or even at a much higher frequency? What came to my mind is the gas stations. The gas stations change the prices more than 365 times a year. What becomes clear is that maybe different theories apply to different firms depending on the industry characteristics. And it might be the case that the price stickiness on the macroeconomic level cannot be explained by a single microeconomic explanation. This becomes clear when we have a look at the following table because Blinder also asked the managers uh, what kind of theory do you think is valid? And we can see here a huge list of different theories and explanations. Why do managers think that the prices are sticky? For example, uh, the most prominent explanation is coordination failure. So firms hold back on price changes, waiting for others like other companies to go first. This is, of course, understandable in case that one company wants to increase prices. When one company wants to increase prices, maybe they are reluctant to do that because of the fact when one single company increases the price, then they will lose customers. So maybe these companies will wait and all the companies will wait with these kind of price increases. As I said, there are a lot of different theories and explanations why the prices are sticky. But in the end, we just have to accept that prices are sticky in the short run. This is the end of the first part. I'll make a cut here. Thank you very much for watching this video.